06. I hope I got this right because me and numbers are not so friendly. Is it the one? Good. <laughs> take any position we want to take as we pray. We shall pray. Our gracious, loving Father, just as this song says, we wish to draw nearer and nearer to you. For you did a wonderful job for us, stepping into our place, Lord, hanging on that cross, going through the experience of abuse just for us so that we can be saved. Forgive us, Lord, where we have done wrong. We know that our paths throughout the week has had some bumps and low ends, but Lord, we pray that as you have brought us here, may your hand hover above us. May your blood, Lord, flow over each and every one here present to wash us from all our sins and wrongdoing. Lord, may you please open our ears, open our hearts and cleanse them, Lord, so that we are ready and receptive to your word. Hear your servant, Wallace Wachuma. You have appointed, Lord, to stand and deliver your word through his mouth. Touch his brain, says Lord, touch his lips, so that when he delivers your word, it will be as clear to us as you would love us to understand it. So that, Lord, we accept your word and glorify you. We are mindful of those of our brothers and sisters who are not keeping well. Agnes, Antipola, Grace, and the others, Lord, may you revisit them this afternoon 
and touch them, Lord, with a healing hand. For we know you have the power to heal and restore life. Just as we have been studying this morning about the power to resurrect, you do all these because you are a wonderful God and a clear God of creation. Jehovah, we thank you for listening to our prayer this morning. As we sit down now, listening and waiting to listen to your word, give us, Lord, the heart that will receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Sister Ashley will give us the scripture reading. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 19. And it reads, the word, of the, Lord came, the, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, servant Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak, I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not, be a, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you and, to say, and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will, res and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see, what the word, to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. And I, I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment on my people because of, because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready, stand up, and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Ashley, for reading so beautifully. Now is the time for tithes and offering. Uh, it's a wonderful service that everyone can participate and glorify their God according to the blessing that God has given them. Uh, as we collect the, the offerings, I would like to encourage people that if you cannot <coughs> use a uh, this ordinary system we use to collect, you can also see Pastor Neil at the end of the service next door. Uh, you, he has got a card reader, and if you want, you can also do so online, do the transfers online. If you do not have the details, you can ask those bank details from Pastor Neil. As you'll be standing next door, he will happily provide the details to you. Thank you.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us. And we thank you, Lord, for even enabling us to return part of what you've blessed us with to your service. Receive it and use it, Lord, according to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Children's story. Charity will give us the children's story. Happy Sabbath. So today's children's story is about Samuel. And Samuel was the son of Hannah. Hannah had wanted a baby boy very, very much. And when God blessed her with Samuel, she made sure that he was raised in the church. And one day Samuel heard a voice in the temple. At first he thought it was priest Eli. However, it was actually God calling him. So I'm going to read to you 1 Samuel 3 verses 4 to 10. And this, this is the story about the Lord calling Samuel. The Lord called Samuel, here I am, Samuel responded. He ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call you, Eli replied, go back to bed. So Samuel went back and laid down. The Lord called Samuel again. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call you, son, he responded, go back to bed. Samuel had no experience with the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. Go lie down, Eli told Samuel. When he calls you, say, speak Lord, I'm listening. So Samuel went up and lay down in his room. The Lord came and stood there. He called him as he had called the other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel replied, speak, I am listening. So God spoke to Samuel and told him many things that would happen soon. God spoke to Samuel and was able to use him even though he was young. Samuel learned that it was very important to listen to God. And just as Samuel, we too need to listen to God. And we can listen for God when we read our Bible. And when we pray, we can rest in reassurance that he hears us. So that's the children's story for today. Would anyone like to pray? Jesus, our Father, thank you for money, thank you for charity, thank you for, for me, and thank you for Papa, and thank you for all of the people that's in church. Thank you for everything. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Nava. How wonderful is that? Eh, to know that you have been prayed for by a little girl. Eh? Praying for money, for papa, for everyone and everyone in church. That's wonderful. Eh, I feel blessed eh, because I know the prayer of the little ones. They don't waste time hovering around here. They go straight to God because they are coming from the pure heart. Thank you very much, Nara. I know your dad is expecting a special song from you. Are you going to come with mommy? Yes, she's getting ready. Yeah. 
me so far to find me time. Got to take care of you. You me so far to find me time. Got to take care of you. God will take care of you. Every day, all the way. He will take care of you. Go to the cafe. Go to the cafe. Every day, all the way, he will take cafe. Go to the cafe. Thanks very much, Nara. Uh, God will take care of me. That's really wonderful. That's really wonderful. Uh, today, we've got Brother Wachuma. Uh, God has appointed him to deliver his word to us today. Let's sit tight because the, the flight is about to, to start. Make sure that you buckle up because God has sent him with a special word for you and I. God bless you, brother. Good morning. Is it still morning? Yes. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Right. I'm by no means a preacher, so bear with me as we go through the study of Jeremiah this morning. Uh, uh, I time myself, it should take about 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. So if I go beyond 30 minutes, do give me those stairs and I will know that I've gone beyond the allocated time that I've been given. Um, my title, for those that like a title to a message, uh, is still a working in progress, but we're here now, so I think we'll stick to that one there. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? So humans in general are skillful at making excuses. Since the dawn of time, we have found ways of lessening our responsibilities for things we are not immediately comfortable doing. The first recorded excuse in human history that we read about can be found very early on in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. You'll be familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, of course. And one Mr. Adam says, it was the woman that you gave me. We can be skillful at shifting our responsibilities. Common excuses that I found uh, that I'm guilty myself of using before can be, I don't know, I forgot, I don't understand. I'm too tired. I'm not feeling too well. There's been a death in the family. I don't think I'm ready yet. I've tried that before and it didn't work. I'm too scared. I'm sure we recognize some of these excuses in ourselves uh, that we use. So I looked up some creative excuses that people have used for not showing up to work. <laughs> And here are just a couple. Uh, it, it's a shame you can't read that. I hope you can from the sides here. They're slightly bigger, but I'm reading from there, and it's a bit small. So one employee called their boss and said they were not coming into work because they accidentally caught their uniform on fire, putting it in the microwave to dry. <laughs> An employee's child stuck a mint up his nose and had to go to a and &E to have it removed, so it didn't show up for work. When asked why they were late for work, the employee said they Q-tipped their ear the night before and went too far into the left ear. They missed their alarm in the morning because somebody moved their alarm to the left side of the bed and they couldn't hear. <laughs> in our Christian journey, we too can find all sorts of creative excuses or justifications for not immediately obeying God. 
such as it's a preacher's job. It's not my calling. What will people think of me? I'm not already, I've already served before. Let somebody else do it. I'm too busy. I'm too tired, too old, or too young. It has been said, excuses are tools of the incompetent, and those who specialize in them seldom go far. He that is good at making excuses is seldom good at doing anything else. He who excuses himself accuses himself. Excuses only limit our potential of what we are truly called to be. They hinder us from soaring to the heights, from the heights God created for us to reach. Today, we'll see how Jeremiah had every excuse or objection or justification for when God first called him. His excuses are often our excuses for not heeding and following God's word. But we'll see that God had a perfect answer for those excuses and the answers came with a promise. A promise that he will always stand beside us and won't allow our short-sightedness to hinder his work in and through us. So there's five excuses from the lovely scripture reading that my beautiful wife read uh, earlier this morning. So the first excuse from the text is found in chapter, uh, verse five rather, or chapter one in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations not a priest like his father or his grandfather before. A prophet was a chosen and authorized spokesperson for God who would declare God's word to the people. We often think prophets as people who can tell the future. But a prophet spoke messages of the present that had future ramifications. There were fourth tellers more than there were foretellers exposing the people's sins and calling them back to their covenant responsibilities before God. You could argue that being a prophet was more challenging and demanding than serving as a priest. The priest's duties were predictable. Everything was written down in law. The prophet never knew from one day to the next what the Lord would call him to say or do. The priests worked primarily to preserve the past. The prophet labored to change the present so the nation would have a future. Priests dealt with external rituals, sacrifices, offerings, and services, whereas the prophet tried to read and change the hearts of the people. Priests ministered primarily to individuals with various needs whilst prophets, on the other hand, addressed whole nations, and usually the people they address didn't want to hear the message. Priests belonged to a special tribe, and therefore had authority and respect. But a prophet could come from any tribe, and had to prove his divine call. Priests were supported from the sacrifices and offerings of the people, but prophets had no guaranteed income. Jesus too was called to be a prophet. He traveled from place to place, challenging the people to change so that the future in heaven could be guaranteed. Jesus spoke to the hearts of people. Most did not accept the message of repentance for they did not want to change. Jeremiah, much like many of us may have looked at the job description and thought to himself, this task is far too demanding, Lord. He knew that duties and responsibilities associated with the call to being a prophet. But God was ready with a perfect counter offer and response of a promise. And we find it in verse five there. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God may assign a demanding task, 
but his call keeps us going when we don't want to go or ready to quit. We have the promise of God's purpose. The verb there that's used, knew you, has so much more meaning than simply being aware of. It carries the idea of recognition of worth and purpose of him who is known. God knew Jeremiah. He chose Jeremiah and appointed him. He was known by name, handpicked by God and commissioned to serve. Those acts give one a great sense of purpose. The promise of God's purpose allows us to let go of our own plans and to receive God's plan without fear. Like Jeremiah and Jesus, we need to accept that our future is not our own. We are God's children. He has a distinct plan and purpose for our lives and with him in control, there is no degree of failure. Excuse or objection number two from Jeremiah. But I protested, oh no Lord, God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. Jeremiah felt inadequate as a public speaker. Something also shared by Moses and many of us, I'm sure, public speaking is not really something people are very comfortable doing. I myself included. Jeremiah felt his talents were insufficient. He, you could say that he felt inadequate. The dictionary definition for inadequate says, lacking quality or quantity required is sufficient for a purpose. Other synonyms include not good, not capable. But I'm telling you that God is sufficient. If we trust in God, we are powerful beyond measure. I have this healthy-ish interest in sport. And I like to watch movies based around sports. And I like them mainly because they, they motivate me, at least for a minute, to take up a sport and be active. But one trip to the kitchen and I somehow lose that interest. So there's one particular movie that I like based around a high school coach. And this coach has a young team and he's trying to motivate them, to inspire them to be a collective unit, to win championships. And there's one star player on this basketball team of his and he challenges him, he asks him, what is your deepest fear? The young man obviously doesn't respond immediately, but as, as the movie develops, as the scenes develop, we see this young man who seemingly self-destructs at every opportunity when he has some form of success. But the coach almost taunts him, continuously asking him, what is your deepest fear? Eventually, this young man witnesses uh, the unfortunate murder of a family member. And we see him rushing back to his coach as he desperately tries to fix his life. He shows up to basketball practice and when the coach again tries to get an answer from him, what is your deepest fear? He responds with a beautiful quote from Marianne Williamson, and he puts it more eloquently than I will right here, but you can just imagine there's some background music, very emotional, and he goes on to say, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant? gorgeous, talented, fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, 
we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our fear, our presence automatically liberates others. We might feel inferior, but God has a way to overcome our weaknesses and all our insufficiencies. I have come to realize over the years that the person most aware of their inadequacy is the person most dependent on God's all sufficiency. Our only inadequacy should cause us to rely more each day on God. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. His glory is manifested through our weakness. God responds positively to Jeremiah's queries and clear objections. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. Our talents and, ab and abilities may appear inadequate, but God always equips those that he calls. We have the promise of God's provision. The touch was not so much to purify as it was to inspire and empower. It was symbolic of the gift of prophecy before bestowed upon Jeremiah. God blesses not the silver tongue talkers, the chatterboxes, the life of the party people, but the ones whose tongue has been touched in the coals from the altar. God uses not the outwardly most gifted and talented persons, but the ones who are touched by the hand of God. God can use the most unlikely persons to shake up a church, to shake up a community or a nation. Never underestimate the power of touch, especially when God is doing the touching. Excuse number three. The time is not right. Jeremiah said to God, I'm only a youth. The word youth, other versions may say child. This ordinarily denotes a young unmarried man in his teens or early 20s. Most scholars think Jeremiah was around 20 to 25 years young at the time of his call. His reply is not so much revealing his age as it is a much deeper sense of his immaturity. He felt inferior, inexperienced, and intimidated by the size of the task to which God was calling him to do. But there's great reassurance from God yet again. In verses seven and eight, the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you to speak and whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anything, for I will be with you to deliver you. This is the Lord's declaration. God's call may come at an impromptu time, but he never sends forth his servants alone. We have the promise of God's presence. Please note the condition of this promise though. Before Jeremiah could experience God's presence, he had to go where God was sending him, speak what God told him, and reject every fear. Someone once said that when God calls us to a task, he doesn't simply give us a roadmap to which we should follow and then leave us to our own resources. God walks with us. His presence gives us the strength to stand in the face of every assault. Jesus felt the same presence. He and the Father were one. He could go on because God walked with him. What a difference it makes knowing that when we are being sent, someone is going with us. We know we do not have to walk the lonesome road alone, but that we have a traveling companion. The teaching might be dangerous. The Lord did not give Jeremiah a joyful message of deliverance to announce to the people, 
but a tragic message of judgment. Jeremiah would be misunderstood, persecuted, arrested, and imprisoned. More than once in his life, his life was threatened. The people did not want to hear the truth. Jeremiah told them plainly, they were defying the Lord, disobeying the law, and were destined for judgment. God used the image of the boiling pot to communicate the coming wrath to the nation of Israel. And it says there, again the word of the Lord came to me inquiring, what do you see? And I replied, I see a boiling pot. It slipped, tilted to the north, from the north to the south. Verse 13 there, if you're following along. Jewish homes would have a fairly large, wide-mouthed washing or cooking pot. But the unusual thing about this pot that Jeremiah saw was that it was not level. It was tilted away from the north. The pot could at any moment spill its boiling contents toward the south, scolding the people of Judah. The pot represented the nation of Babylon that would invade and conquer Israel. The reason for the judgment was Israel's idolatry and rebellion against God's righteous will. But yet, God responds positively again with a wonderful promise to Jeremiah. In verse 18 and 19, Today I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and population. They will fight against you, but never prevail over you, since I am with you to rescue you. What God, say, what God says through us might be dangerous, or might appear dangerous, but God gives us strength to endure. We have the promise of God's prevailing love, which will accompany us always. Notice the architectural terms that are used in that verse. A fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls. They were all solid, unshakable, like God who conceived them, and the prophet whom they would become a character of. God reassured Jeremiah, attack you they will, overcome you they will not. The person who stands with God will prevail. Someone once said, one with God is a majority. Alone we are helpless. With God we prevail. The fifth and final objection from Jeremiah. We see him say, God was expecting an immediate action from Jeremiah. God said to him, now get ready, stand up and tell them everything that I command you. In Jeremiah's day, the men had to tie their loose robes together with a belt in order to run or do work. Jeremiah was in for a struggle. He had a fight on his hands, saw the face, dress yourself for work, or get up your loins, was a metaphor that meant get ready for action. Today we would say roll up your sleeves. God called Jeremiah to act. He was called to move out amongst the people. He was called to deliver a potentially politically incorrect message he would not be welcome, nor would he be accepted. He would make his hearers rather angry. But God also had a perfect response for Jeremiah. God expects immediate obedience. If we do not, we are in danger of facing God's wrath. We have the promise of God's power. Do not be intimidated by them, God says. I will cause you to cower before them. 
immediate obedience is the only appropriate reason, uh, response when God calls us. People, friends, family might even mock us and question whether God was really calling us or whether he dialed the wrong number and maybe perhaps we might have a poor connection and got the wrong message. Is God calling you? What will your answer be? Will it be an immediate response or a delayed one with an excuse? God is standing at the door. He is prepared to fulfill his promise and purpose in us. He will equip us. He will enable us. He will protect us and he will accompany us. Are we obeying God's commandments? Then he will protect us. Are we taking the time to listen to God's word? What is he calling us to do? Are we prepared to put aside all excuses and respond without hesitation? Are we prepared to respond immediately and allow, and allow God's will and purpose to be accomplished, no matter what others might think or respond? My hope, my prayer today, is that we will listen to God's voice and respond to the call, knowing that in the company of God, we shall prevail. And when the Lord comes, we shall not stand accused from our excuses. When the call comes, what will your answer be? Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Wallace, for, I think, a timely message. So often we do come up with excuses. I have mine. I think you do have yours as well. And the message is clear. When God calls, no excuse. Our closing hymn is number 99, number 99. It's done. <clears throat>
and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise that you will take care of us. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we have in you that when you call, Lord, we know that you will accompany us and equip us for the task at hand. Lord, be with us as we leave. Lord, disperse us with your blessings. And till we meet again, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen.